Uh, hello, here we are um, for, I hope, going to be a very entertaining session. Who's been to uh, the great debate before at previous Edinburgh's? Oh, marvellous. So most of you know the rules. Um, there's going to be a motion, which is going to be put by the team in the red, and there's going to be the opposers of the team in the blue. Um, the motion this year is, this house believes that the UK games industry is only one life away from being game over. Quite a, quite a strong motion, I think, and... Uh, <laughs> They look very worried already, don't they? Not that I'm going to be biased in any way, but getting the UK development scene to vote for that kind of motion is rather like Turkey's voting for Christmas, I feel. But, however, um, the games industry has been great for Great Britain. We hit the ground running, and at one stage, a fifth of the world's video games were made here. The decline has been steep. Once mighty publishers have imploded or had their ownership taken offshore. One thriving development sector now has to watch as its most talented core is transplanted to where the, where the pay is higher and the tax is lower. Are we now able to look beyond the tipping point and see the abyss, or is that just a load of old tosh by gloom mongers? Will doughty, earnest, innovative, punch above its weight Britain triumph again? Have we still got it takes, what it takes in this bigger and better connected world? You are going to be the judge. So how it works is, and I'll introduce the speakers in a minute, even though they don't need introduction, is that the main proposer is going to talk for five minutes saying why he believes in the motion, and the main opposer is going to speak for five minutes in saying why that's a load of tosh, and then the second guy is going to talk for another five minutes, and the second person on this side is going to talk for five minutes. Then you get as much time as we've got for some Q&A, ask them some really testing questions, try and catch them out, try and make them feel pretty stupid. Um, then we're going to have two minutes summary from both sides, then you, the audience, are going to decide. And if you can't see by a show of hands, we're going to do it the way it did last year. You have to all switch sides, so we find out, and then we'll find out who's the winner. So, leading off, who are trying to uh, convince you that the uh, UK is one life away from disaster is Mr. Fred Hassan, who's the executive director of Games Capital Limited. Uh, he started in independent television, worked for the BBC, but we all know Fred, of course, for starting Tiger uh, way back in 2001, where he served as CEO until 2008. And he was also one of the founders of Inter Edinburgh Interactive. At that time, it was in Edinburgh Interactive Games Festival. Helping him out in his noble uh, cause is Sean Dromgoul, uh, CEO of Sun Research and Game Vision. Sean has been delivering... Um, consumer research to the games industry for 14 years, so you'd expect them to know something about it. Uh, yeah. Uh, against the motion, we have, leading off, Graham Brown Martin, who gave an eloquent speech this morning, which I didn't see because I was doing the public sessions, but I'm, I was heard it was very good. Uh, the, the founder of Learning Without Frontiers, a disruptive thinker and activist in the field of learning. I don't think we need to say anything else about the, from that. Convincing speaker... We'll leave it at that. Uh, Rob Lowe, marketing manager at Nintendo UK. He's been there for seven years, launching the Wii 3DS and some of Nintendo's most brilliant franchises. So they are the people who are supporting the, that these, what these people are saying is tosh. So um, we're going to try and um, catch them out wherever possible. If you feel compelled to say something horrible, please do. And uh, that's the whole essence of this game. So please... <laughs> Give it your best shot. <laughs> Big round of applause for Fred Hassan. I am the Grim Reaper. <laughs> it was Sean and I that um, persuaded the content committee of EIF to have a debate like this a couple of years ago. And I think that it's one of the best ways of trying to get a good discussion going uh, and allowing people to say slightly over the top things um, so that you can just get it all out in the open and have a good airing. Because I think British people are a little bit too conservative, a little bit too reserved about what they say. So I'm going to try and be non-British. So the UK games industry is one life away from game over. Ten years ago, when I was forming Tiger, we were number three in the world. You heard Ian say it. 20% of the world content was delivered from here. Um, we also, if you looked at the Elspeth data of the time, had three publishers in the top ten. 
amongst all the EAs and all the others. Three British-owned publishers. Where are we now? No British-owned publishers, and we're number six, having been overtaken by Canada, Korea, and China. And now, what are we seeing? Studios are closing, cutting jobs, and what's even worse, we're not equipped for the new opportunities that are presenting themselves to, to, the, um, to, the, to the sector. And the reasons for that are structural. And I think they're quite, it's, if they're structural, that means you can't change them very fast without a will to do that. And so I think the reasons for that are very important. And I'm going to just talk about two reasons. First one is the development com community is not prepared for the changes because for too long it was tied by the bollocks to the publishers. And not only did it not like the publishers a lot of the time, because it just wanted the money and get on with it, but um, there, was, there, 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 there was also, they gave up their right to understand the audiences that they were dealing with by going through the publishers. So you had a development community that, although it had mega bucks uh, in terms of budgets, and these were testosterone fuel type budgets, and they were good to talk about, we got a contract of five million or whatever it was, um, there was also a sort of hint of being a subcontractor to a much larger company. And the second reason um, is because of government policy and the whole way in which this government runs the economy and not this government, I mean conservatives, this is not political, this is not labor or this is about the way in which the UK addresses its um, industri uh, industry and trade and, uh, and commercial policies. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about those and, s and tell you why I think they are structural problems which are going to be very hard to resolve. And this is why I think, unfortunately, we are uh, going to end up with a, a games industry which is full of talented individuals um, who are working for the benefit and the profit of multinationals and other corporations which are based elsewhere and not for the profit of the UK. And I see that as a real problem. I really do. So, I've already said we had... We had nearly 20% of the old, uh, games market in 2000 from a market position of 8%. So the, the global market position of the UK was, was, was um, you know, we, we, were, we only had sold 8% of the games that were sold worldwide, but we produced at least double that, if not more. And as I said, we're now, we're now well behind, um, in, and um, we're six in the world now. Um, and we're left, yeah. And regrettably, uh, yeah, well, so blah, 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 blah. I'm just cutting some stuff out. Um, we saw this happen before in, um, in the UK. Um, in the 50s and 60s, we had a film industry with some studios that were viable. And of course, they relied on a domestic market um, and they were viable. But th those, those film studios have now gone. And what have we got in the UK film industry now? A very talented bunch of people working in the film industry who, who, if they want to make good, more often than not go over to LA to work in the US market. And the legacy of having, having worked for these publishers and, uh, is that now with all the new opportunities, and we've heard about gamification, we've heard about online games and everything, and how one needs to get close to, to um, your customers to understand how you're going to deliver compelling content, well, I'm afraid too few of our, of our games industry really understands that. Um, and that's because the publishers, the publishers did that for you, um, even though it was only box products, and they're struggling with online communities as well. Um, but that leaves a big gap. And, and, um, and I'm afraid that because we were number one in Europe, we represented 50% of the European market for games, and we were well ahead of France, the next biggest, and, and Germany, we always had this idea that we were un invincible. And we let our egos get carried away with that. And it was a message that I remember when I was running Tiger, you know, you shouldn't say anything that's negative about the, the games industry. Of course I understand why, why we shouldn't do that and we should talk it up. But, what, but, but we started believing our own propaganda. And that propaganda, which was maybe for going out and selling at E3, wasn't necessarily the same narrative as we needed to have um, amongst ourselves when we were talking to government. But the government was more than happy to hear that hubristic kind of 
um, testosterone-fueled, we are it kind of attitude because it suited them because then they could turn around and say, well, we don't have to do anything, do we? Uh, you'll be okay. And look what's happened now. And there is one honorable exception, and Ian's not going to like me saying this, but seeing he was trying to pile in and say that we were talking rubbish in the first place, uh, I'm, I'm going to say that the one honorable exception that I saw amongst British developers who actually knew that all of this was happening was Miles Jacobson, because when he decided to break his relationship with IDOS uh, and, and take it somewhere else, he knew that the most important thing he had was his database of players. And of course, look at what happened. Um, I'm afraid, you know, uh, uh, the football manager has won hands down. Um, and the brand championship manager just went into, into, into sort of poverty. Um, you are in absolute deep shit now. <laughs> 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 I've got to piss everybody off. Uh, and then, and then, yeah, and, and, um, and then, and then, <laughs> and then, now I'm going to really piss off the people from Scotland here because you, 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 you saw, you saw what, what, but, but listen, this is, I'm nearly finished with developers now. Now I'm going to get on to government and you haven't heard anything. But, but you saw with Real Time Worlds a good example of where console thinking for design and everything to go into a game was applied to an online game, which ended in the spending of an awful lot of money uh, and really a bit of a catastrophe with Real Time Worlds up in Dundee. And that was precisely because uh, we, we blindly had an allegiance to this, to this kind of business model of the, of the, of the large AAA game. Um, so that, that... You are actually running out of time, by the way, Fred. Oh, come on. I've got to say something about government. So, so I was going to say... I was They're all asleep, though. Okay. Okay, so that's the first point. And, it's, and, and uh, I was going to say something about why we don't have funding in this country. And, and I think that looking around and when you see what's happened in other parts of Europe, particularly in Germany, where you see companies like Big Point, Travian with, and Gamesforge, they have managed to get good investments in, the com in, in, in their own businesses and now those are becoming world-class businesses in the online world. And one of the problems that we've got here as well is not, we don't have access to, 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 to capital. Um, and then I think that's partly to do with uh, government policies as well. So, um, why, why is it... Uh, what, OK, I'm going to try and cut this right down. I think we've got um, a real problem with our industrial policy here. Um, a few weeks ago, maybe a couple of months ago, there was a story about how a contract for making railway carriages um, for the Thames, Thameslink line had been awarded to a German company, Siemens, instead of the, the, the company up in Derby. And I think that, and, I, and for me, I cannot understand a, 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 any kind of um, industrial policy that, that does that sort of thing. The company that lost the contract in Derby actually said, if that had been in France or in Germany, we, that would not have happened. It would have been awarded to, a, Brit, uh, to a, a French or German company. And I think that the reason, the reason that that is there is actually get, Graham gave me the key to, to, to sort of summarizing this very well this morning in his talk is that we've got a 19th century industrial policy in this country that is about free trade, some blind ideological allegiance to free trade, which actually no one else in the world, no one else in the world uh, adheres to. We are the only ones who promote it, and we're the only ones who, 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 who play by those kinds of rules, which are self-imposed, disabilitating rules that not only injure the, the, the games industry, but other industries as well. And it dates back to a 19th century uh, epoch is when we had gunboat diplomacy and we owned 25% of the world and we could go around and shoot up people and make them do things that we didn't, that, that were good for us. Okay, I'm, and I'm afraid I'm, I'm really going to have to stop you here, Fred. I mean, <laughs> okay. you're here to defend the well, games can... industry when you're talking about rolling stock and... and uh... <laughs> Okay. And, and, and I can elucidate okay. on why I think okay. that's good. Okay, All right. thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> so we heard from Fred there talking about how we, we get the BAFTAs and the gongs, but we don't get the bottom line contribution to this in this country. Uh, he didn't actually talk about some of the great studios that have come out of the ashes of some of the uh, games companies that have gone down uh, for changing market conditions and how there's a huge rise of great independent development going on right now. And there's some great success stories from uh, whether it's uh, Moshi Monsters or RuneScape 
for what the guys are doing in D&D from the ashes of, of uh, real-time worlds. There's some great things happening with my world, and there's Colin over there who tell you about it. But I'm not going to in any way bias this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say you should stick to supporting rolling stock arguments and give up on the game stuff. Anyway, <laughs> to challenge him, here comes Graham. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank my esteemed colleague, Fred, for making it so easy for me. <laughs> um, I can understand the policy. Uh, the policy is to force everyone to buy uh, the, you know, uh, uh, games just because they're from the UK. Yeah, perfect protectionist market strategy rather than just the great games that are coming out from the UK. Um, of course, the, the proposition, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the argument, it's an interesting notion, isn't it? And as we know from our experience of playing games, which we all do, um, the reason why you get to the point of having a single life is because the game has got more complex and things are happening faster. That's what happens, isn't it, from Space Invaders. I was having a lovely breakfast with James this morning and he was giving me some of this juice. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's absolutely right, actually. It gets, kinda, it, gets, it gets tougher. You know, that's where you get to your last life. And that's when you get to get smarter. The game industry is no different from so many industries and, it being, and it's being challenged by the disruptions in the digital world. And as Sean so eloquently proved with his no doubt thorough research in his opening talk this morning, there is no discernible decline in the consumption or demand for games, but the platform for games are changing rapidly. As has also been the case in many other industries and sectors in the face of disruption, the first port of call from industry incumbents and their trade associations is to look to government to help them turn back the tide, to help them shore up their business models with legislation or tax incentives. But this is merely band-aid to protect them from the inevitable when major surgery is required. The, ma the music industry, which I discussed in my earlier talk, has been an example of this, wagging its finger at piracy, blaming peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and the demise of its revenues from an outdated and unsustainable business model, and even encouraging the government to put laws in place under the Digi Digital Economy Bill to criminalise its consumers of music. None of this, however, prevented Apple becoming the world's largest retailer of music. You see, the business model had changed. There is no shortage of creative UK recording artists who have found new ways bringing their music to their audiences. So rather than using perhaps rolling stock, I'm using the UK creative community as my example. Artists have shifted their own model to live performance and revenue streams from film and advertising licensing to a point where the actual recorded album is often seen as a promotion for their live work. The freemium model, if you like. They've adapted. They are still there. You know, we are still finding new, valid, vital recording artists appearing from the UK all the time. The talent is there. It is not being stopped. It is exporting, despite what's happened to its former slave owners. And so it is with the UK game industry. The glory days of the UK game industry, game industry was bootstrapped in the 80s with the BBC Micro. Our hero developers, such as David Braben, and indeed even the origins of, of IDOS, originated from these days. Here was a program that put creativity in computing right at the core, where young people were eager to create and explore rather than what they've become today, passive consumers using predominantly console-based computing. Gaming, sorry. The emergence of the console that has dominated gaming over the past 15 years has been good to the game industry's old guard, who have grown rich, fat and lazy on the spoils. But these days are coming to a close, and it is this old guard who faced the one-life scenario. And if they don't embrace the changes, they will lose, as we already as already seen, in the freefall descent of market cap amongst those businesses, as shown by Edward from BMO this morning. Whilst it is an honour to be amongst the House of Lords of the UK gaming industry, I wonder where the pretenders to the crown were, are seated. Who in this room represent Apple? Anyone? Facebook? Google? Nobody here. There's someone from Google. One person employed from Google. Returning to my BBC micro-connection, it is true that today we face a challenge in nurturing the talent required from our education system that can put the UK back on top. So where, what is the industry actually doing to address this? Whining about tax credits is not enough if you haven't got the raw talent or simply want to be a nation of sales offices for gaming. Where we discover exciting new talent, however, say, for example, in the case of 18-year-old Jake Davis of Lulsec, the UK hacking crew of teenagers that brought down Sony and the News International sites, we criminalised them, when in reality they could be the new Facebook or Google. And I bet they didn't learn the shit at school. That's our talent. And let's not forget that Connect was born in Cambridge, UK. The BBC Micro for the young generation is the web, Facebook, Google+, iOS, Android. 
That said, the talent is alive and well in the UK and is doing well. Companies such as Media Molecule and Mind Candy, just two examples of UK creativity that has succeeded in recent years and exported. For the UK games industry to prosper and use its last life to find the power up and magic coin that buys all the new lives, it needs to reconsider its outdated practices and look at process versus randomness based around throwing as much shit at the wall until it sticks or those massive budget or hit and miss titles. My recommendation is it builds a process around making good games only by using smaller budgets, test early, and throwing away the bad ones often. The digital world of perpetual beta, freemium, social media, and app stores provide the perfect sandbox environment for young developers to do this. Is the UK game industry one life away from game over? Maybe the old one is. But this is a moment of disruption, change, a transition period, no different from when Ian went from the games workshop to the world of video games. If you can't stand the heat, get the fuck out of the kitchen and let the younger, brighter stars take over. Give them their chance. They could hardly do worse. If you love your talent, set it free. It's construction time again and an opportunity to seize the day and rise to the challenge of creativity. The game industry is dead. Long live the UK game industry. Thank you. Yeah. Not bad. Uh, <laughs> OK, uh, I'll say the first round is uh, neck and neck. <laughs> so to uh, tip it into, the, into uh, these guys' territory, here comes Sean. He's got all the data, 14 years. He's going to tell you exactly why that's a load of old tosh. Um, that's exactly what I'm not going to do. As you, uh, as you may have expected, um, uh, uh, I slightly disagree with our chairman on this one. Um, I'm going to, we've done enough facts today. We've had facts, 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 too many facts. You can't be expected to remember all these facts. I instead am going to paint you a picture, okay? And I'm going to try and persuade you. As Graham said this morning, facts are free. We can, you can look up the facts for yourselves. I'm going to tell you a story, persuade you why you should vote for this motion, not against it. It starts like this. It's a picture. That's tumbleweed. I'm doing tumbleweed. <laughs> now we're going to go back to rolling stock. I came up, I came up here from uh, London by train. And if you come up from London by train, you come up through Doncaster. A somewhat forgotten town, but you come up through Doncaster. Must have been the 1850s. The good people of Doncaster were thinking, they're building this train. It's going to go from London to Edinburgh. It's going to go right through our city. What's the bit of our city that we should show all the people going through on a train? I know what we'll do. We'll put it right through all those huge, beautiful, red brick warehouses that are currently building fantastic things for the entire empire. We'll put, we'll put the train right through the middle of that bustling, thriving, fantastic part of Doncaster. Wonderful piece of 18th century, 19th century ebullience. And what's it like now when you go through Doncaster? It's dead. Huge, beautiful red brick monuments to an industry that has died and gone and moved on and left. Now that's what we have to be careful of. That's what we have to watch out for. That's why I'm going to manage to persuade you, tough though it may sound, to vote for this motion. I gave up smoking recently. Um, smoking is a very bad thing, as you know. But giving up is frigging insane. I don't know if you've ever tried giving up smoking. Your mind, in my case, a magnificently disciplined organ. <laughs> my only one. Your mind <laughs> suddenly suddenly just trips off all over the place, all the time. It's like thoughts here, thoughts there, wisps, little delicate things, and you, you just can't quite pin them down. Then you capture, you get one, you get it down, you pull it down, you remember where it fits into everything else. Maybe from a wisp it's become a notion. A couple of notions stick next to each other, they become an idea. Ideas, you phrase them, you put them out there, you let other people sort of listen to them, that's a proposition. You put a few propositions together, you've got a hypothesis. Test that hypothesis, that's the whole point of a hypothesis. It becomes a theory. That, not unlike what Graham was talking about this morning, that's how we get to knowledge. Knowledge is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And we all want it, and it starts with those crazy little wispy notions, and it ends up being a theory. 
If a theory sticks around for 50 years, we start to call it a law. However, what also happens is these theories don't stick around for 50 years. They're proved wrong and they die. You thought you had something, you thought it was fantastic, and it evaporates in your hand. The world was flat. Uh, everything is made up of four different elements. Uh, you can save money by cutting down on the number of police in London. All these theories seem to, seem to evaporate. Now, in a very similar way, business works. It starts with an insight. It starts with one person um, sees a gap in the market, a little, a little bit of demand that is unmet, and they reckon they've got a way of fulfilling it. Then they, they attract other people to that project. They like other people wanting to be involved in, in, in their thing. They can make a little money. That becomes a thing that they can all do all the time. Next thing that happens is um, you sort of, it, you, perhaps you want to grow slightly quickly, so you need to attract capital. Um, you've also got to keep the costs down and reinvest in the business. Our own chairman, ladies and gentlemen, lived in a van for three months with another man washing only in a gymnasium <laughs> so he could do that to get Games Workshop started. True or false, Ian? Absolutely true. Three and a half months. Actually. Three and a half months, yeah. Okay. You didn't get a big price for the van after that, did you? It was, uh... <laughs> anyway. Then the industry, then the, uh, we've got a business that's working, that's set up. If it's any good, other people come. Other people start to compete with you. Other people, the people that you've trained and are working for you, they go off to work for them. They, uh, uh, a, a sort of cluster of people who are good at that thing builds up. Then the associated trades, you might need lawyers. You might need, um, you might even need research. You might need marketing people. You might need accountants. You might need all sorts of graphic designers, whatever it is. All these people, they build up, they form around this cluster. And um, about the time that the people involved in running each of those businesses agree not to tear each other's throats out in public and be vaguely polite to each other, that's when you've got an industry. That's when you've got an industry. Competitive, thriving, uh, sharing skills, using everybody's uh, desire to make it work uh, effectively. The thing that holds it together the thing that makes industries thrive, obviously money, money goes without saying, but also hope. You need hope. You've got to have um, all of them thinking they can, they can do this thing that they're doing slightly better. I've, I've met lots of businessmen. I've met very few businessmen who pride themselves on doing it 5% cheaper. I've met a few, but not many. I've never met a businessman who didn't pride himself on doing it better. And that's what industries naturally collate towards. But just like theories can burn up and die, so can industries. Industries can just dissipate. They can start to go away. The reasons I thought Fred elucidated perfectly, and so I won't go into again, but they can start to just move away. A slight lack of attention here, a slight bit of support there, slight unsensitivity to the fact that other people have much better trading environments than we do, the beginning of some sort of brain drain, and the whole thing starts to go away. And just like there's nothing as old as an old, bankrupt, worthless theory that was proved to be wrong, so there is nothing so sad as an industry that's gone. Just like those big buildings in Doncaster, those big empty shells in Doncaster, we must avoid that. Now, obviously, I feel your pain. I realise you're struggling with this. What can you do? Well, here's what you could do. Edinburgh votes to say everything's fine. Not much of a headline, is it? It's kind of thin. doesn't really travel. Edinburgh votes to say that the UK games industry is just one life away from game over. That might have an effect. That might catalyse a response. That is why I would ask you to support this motion. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> That was brilliant. Thank you, Sean. Totally irrelevant, but brilliant. Uh, um, finally, we have our second opposer, Rob Lowe from Nintendo. Take it away, Rob. I'm going to start off with one, uh, one singular piece of evidence um, that the UK industry is thriving. Our premier research company, the CEO of our premier games research company, can afford clearly luxurious pale blue linen suits from very expensive retailers. So 
there must be something good going down. Um, second thing, sorry, I'll just to play with that. I think people in the games industry have very short memories. It's a cyclical industry. People forget that. Um, this cycle has been the most successful in the games industry ever in terms of the amount of people playing games, the amount of consoles sold. It is the end of a cycle. Um, what happens at the end of the cycle is that the business starts to kind of go down a little bit. That's what happens. It's inevitable. And it's true that there is a brave new world of, of a different type of gaming coming, social gaming, mobile gaming, which Graham spoke very eloquently about. Um, but home console, a new home console uh, generation will continue for at least the short term, the next couple of cycles, to be the ultimate driver behind the games industry. And that's what's coming up soon. Next year and the year after, we will see a new Xbox, a new PlayStation, and a new Wii. And there'll be new ideas, new developers, um, and new bright things coming out of every single developer, whether it's in the UK or anywhere else. But I don't want to talk specifically about, I don't want to talk about the world, I want to talk specifically about the UK. So the UK is, is the most unique games industry in the world. It has the earliest adopters out of any country in the world. They buy hardware like that, they buy games like that, and they latch onto an idea straight away. Anything that's a great idea will be successful if it's marketed in the right way. Um, it also is the biggest multi-owner. Everyone wants everything. So if you go into someone's living room, you're as likely to see an Xbox, a PS3, and a Wii, a DS, an iPhone, an iPad, all sitting around. And that is absolutely the truth. Um, and how could you say that the, games, the UK games industry is one life away from game over when there are more people playing games in the UK than ever before by a huge margin, which Sean showed on the charts. The hardcore gamers have stayed the same. The casual gamers have increased exponentially over the last few years, um, which is incredible for us. And I think what's key to notice as well is that the UK household penetration of consoles is, is just incredible. You know, we are the third market in the world behind Japan and America. But the percentage of households that have a games console in it is far beyond anywhere else. We are a nation of gamers. Um, and you might say, OK, but then the developers are all coming from somewhere else. But you look at some of the biggest games from the biggest consoles from the last year or two. So the biggest seller on DS this year has been Art Academy, developed by Kuju in the UK. One of the biggest premier titles on, on PlayStation over the last couple of years has been, um, has been Little Big Planet, uh, developed by Media Molecule. Connect launched with Connect Sports and Connect Adventures, developed by Rare. Now, these are UK developers, and they're all big. Some, some of the biggest titles we'll ever see launching the biggest pieces of hardware. It's incredible. Um, so I, d I think there's, there's absolutely no way you could ever consider that the UK games industry is one life away from being over. It's in the healthiest state it's ever been. We should all be absolutely proud of ourselves. And in this room, we've got the future of the games industry sitting here as we move into all the different devices, all the social gaming, which is going to take us even further. So I'll counter their argument um, with that. Thank you very much. Very good. Okay, uh, it's now your chance to grill um, the train spotter and the bard or um, <laughs> the angry teacher and Mario. So um, I will throw it over to... So we're just a summary here. Um, very, very equal so far, I think. It's going to be a very close vote. And um, we've got to think about... You know, keep to the subject matter. Is the UK development community going to be more successful or less successful in the future? Um, I think there's plenty of evidence that... Um, some of the examples that Rob mentioned, that some of the ones I mentioned earlier, that it's still going to be okay. We are the most creative nation in the world, not just in games, but in music, in fashion, in TV, in architecture, in design. The whole world wants our content. We just have to find a way to uh, make sure that our games community continues to thrive, continues to prosper. And with self-publishing, it gives them a whole new opportunity. So let's uh, start with anyone who'd like to answer, ask a question of either side. We've got a few minutes, in fact, quite a few minutes to grill them intensively. Do not hold back. Just embarrass them where you can. So where do I see it? The front. Thank you. Hi. Um, well, undoubtedly, times are changing, and there have been some major closures uh, over the last 10 years, and the most recent being THQ and Black Rob Monumental in, in Nottingham. A big blow to MMO development in, in, the, uh, in the UK, Bizarre, Disney, pulling out BlackRock and all of that stuff. But of course, people are creating things. Um, my question, I guess, is around addressing the change and what we do. And really, I'd love to hear from the panel about some of the strategies that we should be thinking about 
to take us forward because we can't, nothing stays still and everything changes. But what are some of the strategies that we could be thinking about in order to perhaps deal with this change that's happening all around us? Um, whilst that's an important question, it's, it's kind of a little bit off the, off the, off, off the message because we're trying to decide whether these guys are going to win or these guys are going to win. There are, I think we can have a, a debate later, but you can have a go if you want. But um, if we phrase the question as uh, what would stop it um, being one life away from game over. Uh, it would be um, Ian's work with a um, Hope Livingston review on highly, much more targeted and appropriate education and uh, preparation of people so that when they leave university they don't necessarily have to start from zero. They are skilled in a way that is useful. That would help. Um, a tax system that was not unfairly discriminating in favour of um, us, but placed us on a level playing field with um, the likes of the French the Canadians, the Swiss, who all have created weird little um, tax bubbles to make it much more attractive to make games in those places. Um, um, and what? Uh, a more genuine enterprise policy for new startups. In, in other words, we need, we need a genuine um, enterprise policy. We need to encourage more investment in startup companies and not to have what are organizations that we created in another era for larger companies um, trying to actually do the business of understand and work with smaller di companies that are more dynamic and that, uh, as, as, as Graham stated quite well, for, uh, are working to a different business model. Those, those things. So we need that level playing field and we need the enterprise policy to go with it. And education. And education. Well, clearly, yeah. skills an issue, access to finance an issue, but also the way um, content creators actually interact with those people who do provide finance. There's so many UK developers, you know, criticizing them briefly, is that they don't know how to scale their business. They have a cottage industry mentality. They set their ambitions quite low, unlike in America, where they, s they have limitless ambition. They're, the they're looking forward to sell out at quite early doors. And we've got to change that as a mentality and then also how to approach investors and speak their language. We criticize investors of not being able to approach the games industry, but it is actually a two-way street. I completely agree with that. <coughs> so that means vote for us, yeah? yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. That's still yeah. for us. No, I, 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 yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a bit off topic, but I mean, you know, what's going to help the UK game industry more? You know, a tax bubble in France type thing or, or some good ideas? And it's, good content it's, and great it's, and great titles. It's, it's you capitalizing know what I mean? on our and, and, exactly. It's capitalizing on that. And and, and, I, and I agree. You know, there is an issue in in financing in in the UK. I mean, you know, we, we know that. Perhaps we need different kinds of financing models. I mean, Tech City in Shoreditch with the Silicon Roundabout came up with an idea of a hundred thousand pounds. It's too much. You know, let's go for a Y Combinator type thing like they have in in, in the Valley, uh, which is a smaller amount of money to get things going, to get the ideas going and to provide the professional wraparound. I mean, there's a lot of, like I say, I referred to, you know, rather, you know, jokingly as the House of Lords of the UK game industry, but there's a lot of, of people who have made their money in the UK games industry um, and are willing to help and be the mentor and be the broker to help with the interface with, with those finance organisations. But I don't think the solution to this is to have some um, welfare handout uh, for, for creatives. It's, it's about having great ideas and having the support um, we never from said professionals, that, we never, from never professionals said that. to assist no. in the media. Fred said access to finance, not government support. Well, no, I keep hearing about, tax bubbles and all this kind of stuff support. repeated over and over again. Until it's, it's, okay, it's like going, it's like, it's oi, it's oi, like oi, going oi, fishing order. with Absolute. my father. Order. Order. Playing order. Field. Mark him down one point. Actually, you can't probably get any lower than we've already. Anybody more questions, please? Okay. The two biggest disappointments in the last year and a half, I'd say, have been terrible decisions by American businesses that affect the UK. Activision and Disney making pretty shameful sets of development decisions and then uh, studio decisions to close. George Orwell once wrote that the UK was Airstrip 1 and uh, the bad decisions by Americans are the things affecting the British and, uh, and the ability to uh, successfully look west and east. You know, the Japanese have made pretty helpful decisions around, say, PlayStation funding of uh, Media Molecule and uh, 
the Sega acquisition, Sega's uh, work with Sports Interactive. I think what, what the British development industry can show is the ability to look west and east. I wonder if the panel want to talk about that. Who are you asking your question to? Uh, 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 Fred. Thank you. Is it the UK <laughs> that, that, is it the, is it the UK industry's fault that uh, BlackRock and uh, Bazaar went down? Of course it isn't. Both very, very good studios. So that is precisely my point. We have an industry which is controlled from outside and by interests outside. If, God forbid, we get a double-dip recession and things get worse, do we want to be controlled? Do we want to be at the behest of these multinationals who, when push comes to shove, are going to retrench back to their own countries or at least go back to the very low, lower cost places to go and do their business? That's the problem. That's the whole point. I have never said that there will never be a talented British industry. What I don't want to happen to the British industry is that it ends up like the film industry, a bunch of talented individuals making profit for somebody else, uh, for, an, for, for, for an economy, for another economy um, that is breaking, the, the, uh, that is uh, using tactics like unlevel playing fields like the tax breaks in, in Canada and all the rest of it. I want to see building real, genuinely large companies that can compete worldwide with the talent that we have, because that's what the talent we've got in this country deserves, and not ones that are controlled by decisions from elsewhere when the going gets rough, because what gets cut first? The studios in the UK get cut first, because it's politically more no, difficult. No, no, to no, that, I've got to because stop there right now. No, no, more, no, this is it's rubbish. easier to cut You're them say, here oh, than it is in the States. The, 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 the economy's rubbish, we're going to close you, down Rockstar North. No, it's not going to happen. One They're day, gonna, one day. Studios, if one a content day. is good and it sells on a worldwide basis, it's going to be kept. But you're also talking about the old, school, or the old world model. What about the new self-published, self-financed... No, you're chairman. Oh, you're sorry. not supposed to be saying this fucking shit. Those guys, <laughs> rule all that shit out. It's, like, it's, like, it's not relevant. It's, it's like a record label saying the economy's bad, let's get rid of U2. I mean, I might think that getting rid of U2 is a good idea, but they won't because they make money. I mean, it's, you know, you're not going to get rid of a studio that's, that's brilliant just because the economy's a bit rubbish, because it's making great games. I have a question for Fred. It's not big on Fred time, sorry. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> you I want to take you back to your train spotting days and uh, rolling stock and the closure of a, fact, uh, a contract going elsewhere. Do you think it's right that the UK government should have subsidised a Canadian company so that Canada can then subsidise their games industry or should it be actually a uh, business should survive on its merits? I um, was aware that Bombardier was an, uh, a Canadian company and they're the ones that were allowed by the last government to buy the hard-earned infrastructure that we'd created over years of our workforce for various reasons, our free market attitude which allows anybody to come in and buy our businesses which is not what is practiced elsewhere in the world so I don't like that fact either that it was a Canadian company. But I don't understand. So, so you might save a little bit on a, on a tender that went to Siemens instead of uh, Bombardier, but then what, what, what does the UK economy for itself pick up after that? It picks up all the leftovers. It picks up the social security, the, re, the, the retraining, and all the fallout from that decision we, the, the, the taxpayer has to has to. Can we get it back to games? No, again. no. I'm this sick is, of this. No, this, this is uh, about building a stock. I'm sorry, Ian. You are the chairman. I, I am I'm making, trying to be. I am making a very valid. <laughs> if I'm, I'm the chairman, you're making be quiet. an important point, which is that we want to build a domestic British industry that can have control over itself and go global, but that's and exactly not be what's at the beck and call of decisions made in Japan or America or elsewhere. But that's okay, what's that's happening what right saying. now, if no. you look around. Uh, just to finish, okay. you would end you up have having the, the, the difference of the cost between giving it to Siemens and Bombardier will be all the social security and the retraining and all the other money we have to spend on getting those guys jobs. Okay? The point was about subsidising that. It was about then Canada subsidising so we're protecting Canada. We're, we're shooting ourselves in the foot if we subsidise Yeah, I, do, I, I, don't, I don't think those, a thing like that should be owned by a Canadian company. Okay, let's I move on. Andy it. Payne. I won't, uh, I won't, hi there, I won't address this to Citizen Hassan, not this one. Um, just frankly, you know, the, you, you sort of talk about this UK industry, but it, it's changing all the time. What I'd like to know is, are we looking forward to a point where we have people in this country paying tax 
for the, uh, at the, at the levy that the government decide it may be, high or low, for the work they do and the products they sell, rather than a, a bunch of multinationals. You don't pay any tax whatsoever, it seems. And the, the, the staff that they employ, which is fantastic, they pay their PAYA. We, the workers, don't have any chance. So I'm looking forward, you know, are we looking forward to a, a future of smaller, innovative units that can collaborate amongst themselves and scale their businesses up through possible collaboration? Or are we always going to be worrying about getting funding from these big banks who don't seem to know anything about anything anyway? I mean, I think that there is um, changes happening at the moment. I mean, as a consequence of, of everyone being connected and so on. I mean, I, I, I made a reference to Jake Davis and Lulzec uh, as a particular group, and Anonymous, and there's a whole bunch of from the Chan 4 people and so on. I mean, you know, that's what we have with self-organising groups. And, and the reason why we're scared of self-organising groups is that unlike the large organisations and multinationals, I mean, they're multinationals and large organisations, as we've seen with News International, is, a, is an organisation that, uh, that the person culpable can hide behind. So Murdoch would never go to prison. Self-organising groups are very difficult to kind of identify, uh, and that's why, why, why society fears them. But I think that the idea of uh, not necessarily a hacking group like LOLSEC, but a self-organising group of talented people creating games could very well emerge um, out of this disruption. There's no reason why it shouldn't, and I, I look forward to seeing that. I, I think we can see those games emerging um, from self-organising groups. And that happened back in the hacking days with the Amiga, exactly. when you kind of had pirated games, that they had these little kind of animations at the beginning of when you, not that I ever pirated games, obviously, David, um, but if you kind of had an Amiga and you copied a floppy disk, there were people who kind of had these kind of signature things, and they went, and a lot of them went on to become very talented coders and then very talented games designers, and then from the 90s, they were the biggest kind of designers in the, games designers in the zeros, in the noughties. So you're absolutely right, that kind of, that back room, uh, industry absolutely turns into the, the multi-millionaires of today. All right, can we have another question? Yes, Ray, Ray McGuire. Hello, hello. Uh, yeah, this has got far too serious. This is supposed to be silly, all right? Yeah. So <laughs> the, here's one for you, Sean. Here's one for you. Um, do you think this is possible? Because Cameron today was talking to the Chinese about scanning the internet, basically looking for people doing bad things. Now, if it's possible, of course, that they find out that games are completely responsible for the riots, is it possible that Murdoch will tell Cameron to ban it? Yes, yes, I think that's possible. I think that's entirely possible. Not only possible, but extremely likely, Ray. Um, so, so I've forgotten why we didn't put you on stage this year, Ray. I really have, and I'm suddenly reminded. Um, yeah, that's a real danger, and I'm glad that someone serious has drawn it to our attention. <laughs> Any other questions? Chris? Uh, I'm the chairman. Oh, sorry, Mike. Oh. Uh, it's um, difficult to vote for me anyway um, on this issue because of semantics. Um, you know, it's been mentioned by both uh, sides of this that the industry has continually changed and will continue to change. And it's one of the things that we love about it, uh, those of us that have worked in it or are working in it. Um, if the question were, is the old industry one life away <laughs> from game over? I'd be very much tempted to vote in favor of the proposition. Uh, if it was about the new industry, less so. So um, it'll be fun to see how the vote goes. Uh, it's a matter of semantics in terms of defining the industry. And Graham's point about maybe the people who have you know, been around Edinburgh for 10 years and all of the other UK games industry institutions uh, tend to come from that core, which we saw from Sean's numbers as paying most of the bills anyway. Um, but we're not properly adopting and attracting um, input and, and uh, camaraderie uh, with the Googles and the uh, Facebooks and the uh, Apples of the world, uh, along with all of the other uh, infrastructural app store and uh, downloadable content and, and microtransaction components to the uh, infrastructure of the industry. So I'm probably making it difficult for everyone, but I'm having a hard time figuring out which way to vote, which means it's a pretty good debate. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there's Mr. Parker. 
I was just going to say that um, Chris differentiates between the old and the new. I think even the new, we're behind the curve, actually. Um, if you look at the level of investment from VCs over the past three, four years, the majority of that is going on to mainland Europe, including Scandinavia, primarily Germany and Scandinavia. Very little of that is coming to the UK, if anything. There's a few, few exceptions uh, where we're talking about multi-million pound investments from VCs. So in terms of actually capturing the imagination and having revenue-driving models developed in the UK, we're behind the curve compared to the rest of mainland Europe. And I think that um, there's opportunity for us to catch up, obviously, but at the moment, I think that we've still got a long way to go. And there are a lot of independent businesses starting up. There's a fresh new world out there. But unfortunately, the fresh new world is yet really to capture the imagination of where the money is coming from. That's what I wanted to say. I'm, I'm, your, your, your numbers, of course, are correct. But I think that we also have a situation where um, a lot of people are trying to reboot their businesses. People that have been in the game industry for a while um, are going to a VC, uh, you know, and they put on their, their, their spreadsheet that they want a quarter of a million pound salary. Um, you know, those days are over. And, and because when they're going into VC, they're also going in with a whole bunch of other kids who are still living with their parents. Uh, and only need 500 pounds a month to live. I think that some of the expectation models, particularly coming from out of the UK, are based on, you know, new models based on the old payment structures. And that's why VCs are turning away. Um, I mean, it's just a fact of life. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm basing that on, 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 on knowledge of organisations that are doing that. And I think some of the, the ones that are getting the funding at the moment are, are, are drawing less out of their businesses to get going. Sorry, I'm going to need a microphone. Yeah, yeah, but it's, it's, at the end of the day, it's, 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 if, they're, if they're investing in a business, it's they want to see where the money's going. Yeah. And if they see the money going out to the principal or, or, or you know, the, you know, the, the, the CEO and the creative director and everything else, rather than into the business, they're less inclined to do it. And I, and I, and I, and I would suppose that the ones that they are going with, the, the, the principals are taking less out of the business, they're taking just drawings and they're putting more into the business. Certainly if I was a VC, I'd want to see the money go into the business and not out of the business into someone's bank account. And I think that's just, you know, this, you know, this is my point. I mean, the point I was making in my talk this morning was about forcing, um, you know, 21st century and supporting 19th century practice. We're, we're looking at new business model, you know, new business financing, trying to fund old business models. And it's not going to work. And I think that, that's, you know, it's marrying up those things. And I think, as I was saying earlier, I think some help from um, those who have been in the industry for a while to broker the deals for the, the younger people coming in, the younger talent coming in, I think would be a, a valuable service from the industry to, 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 to keep it going. But that, I don't think that, that puts us anywhere near the notion that we're, 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 we're one life away from game over. I think that the, the, the new industry is alive and kicking, and I think there's a lot of talent um, out there ready, ready, ready to go. I think it's a long way from one life. OK. Tempted, uh, tempted as I am to vote for Sean for his uh, Vote Edinburgh headlines. Um, I think the UKIP policy um, on this side of games for Britain and uh, defensive strategies for economic development in the UK are just ridiculous. Um, and actually, ironically, the idea of tax breaks and all this kind of nonsense. Um, the games industry, British gamers are actually very good, and British innovation has always been very good when the tide is against them. We've always had a chip in our shoulder that everybody else gets it better. And I th actually think that brings the best out of us. So the fact the Germans and the French have got tax breaks, yeah, it would be nice to have them. But I don't think any young studio is sitting there going, damn, I'm not going to start this game because the Germans have got a better tax break than us. I really don't think that's part of the, yeah, sure, it will help the infrastructure going said. forward. It's not what we said. You were talking stop, about stop making up something we didn't say. The tax, <laughs> the tax breaks issue has got, nothing, it's got nothing to do with it. It's got nothing okay. to do with it. It's calm down. Just carry on. It sounded like you were making games for the English Defence League when you were talking. No, I'm, ta I'm, I'm talking about adding value and keeping decisions in the UK. But I mean, you didn't even know it was a Canadian company with run the rolling stock. I, mean, you I did know that Bombardier was a ca Canadian company. Did you know okay. Siemens? All right, next question. Siemens, Siemens are actually re-employing all these people to service the trains once they're in Britain. But okay, we're, we're, we are going to have to have uh, the summary in a couple of seconds. So, Nicholas, and a question at the back. I can't see who you are, actually. Uh, Nicholas from Games Brief. To pick up on what Nick said, um, the... The funding that is going into the games industry is coming out of the UK into the whole of Europe. And the problems that are causing that, and the reason why I think that we might have just one life left, start really early. They start at school. We teach people to ask permission to do things. We teach people that if you want to get something done, you have to f get a, a permission to do it. So, for example, you, 
you build projects. You go and find a publisher who will fund you. You go and find a venture capitalist who will fund you. You go and uh, ask permission to get that stuff done. That permission fundamentally doesn't need to happen. Um, I work with a lot of companies trying to raise money, and the ones which just have no hope walk through the door, and they're not thinking about building businesses. They're thinking about building games. They're thinking about building projects. And that's a legacy of 20 years of building console-style development aimed at traditional publishers. Our competitors globally want to build businesses like the early bootstrappers in the industry. They haven't been conditioned by the structure that Fred has been talking about to think, please can I have permission to build a game? Uh, I don't care what happens after that first game. I'm not building a 10-year plan to be as ambitious as Ian's talking about. I just want to build a game because games are cool and business is rubbish. Uh, that is why I do think we are one life left away. And the, the problem starts not with the games industry, not with consoles. It starts in the really early days of schools and universities who were very much thinking that people, it's all about ticking the box, passing your time, not about building something cool, being innovative, just going and doing it because that's what matters. And that's why I think that we may just be one life left away. I think that applies completely in the face of how the internet grew. Uh, the majority of the big businesses that we now see, like Facebook and Google, didn't start off saying they wanted to be a business. No. no, they did. But when, when Larry and Serge started it, it wasn't about let's, let's, let's go. It was only when they got people like Eric Schmidt on board. The original idea came from doing something really cool on the internet. Same with Facebook. Do you know what I mean? I don't, I don't, I don't buy this that they started off wanting to be a business. You know, they started off doing something really great and it grew from there. And I think the same, the same is true with, with, with games. You have, you have to have the passion. If you just say, right, I'm going to do an MBA and then I'm going to, do, uh, and then I'm going to create some game business with no, no, no creativity, you're not hiding to nothing. That's just what's, what's wrong with the, old, with the old game industry. My distinction is between a project and a business, not between passion and just chasing money. It's the project versus business model that I have. But, we, but what I'm talking about is that the new business model, the new digital business models, have been fu you know, fundamentally started by people that weren't approaching it like that. They were approaching it with a wacky idea that just grew. I mean, whether it was Napster, which ultimately went bust, but you know, now Sean Fanning's coming back to buy EMI, or whether it was Facebook, it didn't start off in, in, in the way that you've described. And even in the old business model, it can, it can work. I mean, uh, talking to Tancred Dyke-Wells from Kuju, he went to Nintendo Japan, and we are a very close company sometimes, to be quite honest. We can be. And he went to them with, with an idea of Art Academy and said, I want to do this on the DS. I had this inspiration by watching a young guy playing on his DS and, and kind of doing the Flipnote studio of doing something much, much bigger and better. And he kind of he presented that idea to Japan. And, and then through going back and forth with them, it now has become one of the biggest titles. And it, it's made a lot of money for the UK games industry because we've sold millions of copies in the UK. And it's kind of, you know, you're right. It, so it would be great to have a massive UK games publisher, but it also, you've got to remember the amount of money that's generated from games that are developed in the UK, maybe published by someone else, but are sold in the UK in huge quantities as well. So the old model can also generate money for the UK. But well, the next point, he had to seek permission. And he got it, he could because have it was a great it. idea, and he had the passion. Yeah. One more at the back, I think. Uh, hi, it's just a, a riposte to Rob's point earlier, but uh, you point to the sales figures in the UK and how, avid, uh, how we are all avid gamers, but you can't use a country's ability as a consumer to prove its ability as a producer. Like, I, I don't see the relevance to the debate of well, you know, the title of the debate is the UK games, games industry is, is one life um, away from game over. It doesn't specify development or commercial. So I took quite a commercial approach, but I also talked about developers as well. Um, you're right in that respect. I mean, it's kind of, but if you create, the, the fact is we are a nation of gamers, and that creates people who are naturally interested in games. I mean, there are more people gaming now than ever before, which means there'll be more people interested in making games than ever before. And yeah, that cycle the, the point is, though, he, he, what you're saying is it's because you read books doesn't make you can, make, you can write them. However, having said that, you know, the UK is, I've said before, the most creative nation in the world, and we are actually very good at making games. So. Yeah, but the point remains. I mean, if you've got a lot of kids playing games, there's an aspiration to be a game yeah. designer. It's now so, cool, it's sort of cool to say, I want to be a game designer. Parents, you know, also playing and games. And therefore, we need to equip them with the skills to turn that passion to but play games. But that's dri it's driving to make so that. Games. So I think Rob's point, you know, I understand the point the gentleman at the back is making, but I think Rob's point is valid. OK, so um, two minutes summary. Which one of you two boys are going to get up and uh, to? <laughs> Ian's dreading what I'm going to say. No, I'm not at I've, all. I've, I've loved gone. every minute of it, Fred. It's been most entertaining. Carry on. OK, well, um, three points. The motion is about the old industry. We started talking about how we were number three in the world 
um, 10 years ago, and now we've sunk to number six. So in my book, in my understanding, we were talking about the British games industry. I think uh, there are some honorable uh, exceptions. Uh, Jagex is one of them, but Moshi Mon Monsters, I would have called an internet company, um, and so would most of the people in this room from the old industry a few years ago, they would have called it an internet company. So, and, and as everything I've heard from Rob and, and Graham, uh, I pretty well agree with. Um, um, Graham said quite rightly that the old industry is doomed um, and it's about changing and it's only going to favour the people that change. And I'm saying that I don't think the conditions for that change to be affected are, are being supported in this country either by the culture we have or by the government policies that we have which I believe are terribly outmoded. Um, secondly, so, so um, that, that doesn't augur well for us. I think it's uh, also, just to put this to bed, I know I started the tax credit, th the tax break thing. Um, I've not said for a long time that I still think that that's the thing that the games industry needs. It would help certain sectors of the, of the games industry. But I've certainly moved to, th th I mean, the issue here is about having a level playing field. And what pisses me off more than anything else is that when the French applied for, the, for a tax break in France, uh, the Treasury resolutely told me that there was no chance that the Commission would agree to a tax break. Even the few days before the tax break was going to be agreed by the Commission, I rang up somebody at the Treasury and they said, no chance. They got it so wrong. Those guys are living in cloud cuckoo land. They really do not know, as I said. This government lives in a kind of old, archaic, 19th century world of gunboat diplomacy and ruling, ruling the waves. And really, we need to change all of that in the same way that uh, Graham was saying we need to change the education system. We really need uh, something to do something about that. And we need to be, feel that we are competing on a level playing field. So it's not about whinging about tax breaks. It's about being honestly being able to go out there and saying, yeah, we're better than you and we can do it but not if your government pumps, uh, the other competing governments pump money into it. So please, don't put words into our mouths. Uh, we, 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 and I think that what has to go with that, it has to go a genuine enterprise policy. A couple of people in the audience have talked about how capital is much easier to get abroad, and it is. Believe you me, that's also what I look at a lot with, uh, together with what Nick and Nick said. Um, and it is easier to get, and it is supported by government, and there is a different culture out there that says give them money, rather than our VC industry that has had a tradition, again, going back to those days of colonialism, of investing all around the world. And it just, and anyway, it doesn't get games, and it doesn't get the internet. And then, finally, I, I, I categorically state British games talent is second to none in the world. But what do we want to do with it? Do we want to go the same way as the film industry? Do we want a load of talented people? It's great fun going to LA and hanging out in there with all the great razzmatazz of the studios and all this stuff that goes with Sunset Boulevard and everything. But do we want that? Do we want an industry that is controlled by multinationals whose ultimate interests, especially if the going gets tough, are controlled by decisions elsewhere. And where, if they have to make a decision between a UK studio and a US studio, they're going to scrap the UK studio because actually politically to do that in the US would be more difficult for them. So, you, and, and I believe that you cannot run an economy on taxes paid by employees. We need value. We need big companies, successful global companies in this country that are paying taxes here and not repatriating the profits they make out of our talent um, back to their own countries. So I think we're very close to being uh, game over, and, but, I'm, but I believe that if we were to adopt some, some decent economic strategies, and that's why I'm going on about government a lot in this, it has a role to play in this, and it's about time it shook itself up. Um, if we applied those, I think we have the talent and we have the ability to go, to go there and create some new, big, great companies that are acting in a global sphere. You should vote for us. Uh, well, just, okay, thanks. Um, what support did Zynga have, or Tencent in China, 
to build their companies in less than three years to a market cap of no, over no, 20 no, billion dollars. No, sorry, you are not cross-examining me. You are making, you was, are making <laughs> sure. You sorry, are making I, was just, sure. I was just thinking aloud, sorry. Um, two minutes from this side, please. Yeah. Um, Zynga didn't have any support. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, it was open door for me. It was an open door for me. Well, I, you know, I think that the... Um, to sum up, I'm not going to uh, take as long as my esteemed colleague. Um, and I'm not going to talk about trains. Um, but also, you know, I think it, it, it really, in the summing up, I think that it was, it was in there. We talk about the old model, the new model. And, and, and for, for Fred to talk about Moshi Monsters is not really a games company, is it? Because it's like internet. It tells me everything that's wrong with the old uh, UK <laughs> game industry. Because apps aren't really game. I mean, that 99p game, what's that, that thing called? What? Upset birds? Oh, no, no, that's not a proper game, is it? No, no, no. Um, and that, that, there it is. I mean, that, 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 that's the problem, isn't it? It's, a, it's, a, it's not about government support or bailouts or any of those kinds of things or lack of capital and so on. At the end of the day, you know, success in games is about creativity and talent. And as, as Ian said earlier, you know, we have an abundance of talent across all media. You know, it's nothing like Hollywood. You know, I mean, we don't want to piss off to mess around in Sun Sunset Boulevard and all that kind of thing. It's having great, great, great games and great ideas. And you know what? The barriers for talent, the barriers for developers to get their product out into the marketplace have never been so reduced in, in, since the BBC Micro. The BBC Micro like, was successful because it was so easy to get a game out there. And now it's easy. You don't have to go through the Nintendos and the Sonys to get your game out there. You can go and put your game on Facebook. You can go and put your game on the web. You can go and put your app on the App Store. It's a piece of piss to get it out there. You just need a good game. You need to be creative and talented. And we have that. Are we, is there, are we one life away? Hell no. Hell no. We've got the talent and the barriers aren't there. We just need to go out there and grab the prize. Vote for us. Thank you. Um. No, no clapping yet. Just, <laughs> but for every Angry Birds, there's a whole shitload of dead birds out there because... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. A and what the UK has got to understand is the business of games, the business of discovery, marketing, analytics, access to finance. They've got to learn the business of games around it the, in these new, out-of-the-ashes yep. companies. We, we can surround it with as much jargon as we like. At the end of the day, if you've got a good game and you get it out there, it will spread virally. And that's, the, that's, that's what's happening on the net right now. And the kids get it. There you are know, over I mean, the half a million talent. apps on the I know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not Name saying... Name more than ten. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's easy. But what I'm saying is, is that the barriers to get your game... You know, you don't have to have that long conversation with Can you name the, the top ten of, of, of games on the App Store today? No, I can't. No. So no, discovery is a real problem. No, but what... But, but what so the, we're my, blindly my, going my, in and my, saying, my point, I've just my made the best in, game in the world... But nobody knows about it. Why My else? point here is that you know there was once upon a time no one knew about Farmville. They figured it out. Can, you know, are we saying that the people in the UK can't figure that out? They can. Yes, but you know, hang on. We you know. I mean, back to the my business of Zynga no, no, started with a back, back to with my, a spamming machine with great back graphics. To, back to my back to my lolsec um, example. You know, uh, lolsec, sorry. lolsec was a brand You're that came from right. nowhere. It's no, globally no. well known. Right. Okay. We're done. No, I'm trying to get back. I'm trying to help. Just stop. <laughs> <Don't you. laughs> All right, folks, it's, is it game over or game on? You decide. So those who think it's game over, please raise your hands. It's not looking good, boys. And who, who says it's game on? I'm afraid the... Uh, huh? I'm afraid the motion is opposed. Big hands for the winners. And a big hand to the not winners. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Who's that geezer? Never seen him in my life before. Thank you.